the whole theme of of this is don't wait till January, right? And so as people are closing in on the end of the year, and whether you've had a good year, a great year, or a miserable year, it's a good point to just sort of reflect on what's happened and really prepare yourself for next year. You know, I think waiting until January, you're already behind the eight ball because institutions will start putting capital to work with whatever their views are. Um, so what what are your views? Here we are, after all these conversations that we have back and forth about macro day to day, finally we've got opportunity to set the cameras rolling and actually capture some of this. I don't know whether it'll end up being something of a macroeconomic counselling or what have you, but um, look, for, for months now you and I have been working together. People will be familiar with seeing our faces on the platform as well. Um, you and I have both, and you still currently yourself, do manage money as I understand. Um, as well as representing Real Vision. Um, I'm here, you know, exclusively focused on Real Vision, which has been some relief following recent years in money management. It's quite nice to take a step back. But I know you're still very much hands on. Um, and, you know, I, I'm checking your daily notes every day, as well as having the, the conversations internally um, within Real Vision. And I just want to take a breath, really, and say, what on earth is going on from your perspective at the moment? So I think we share a similar process, but we rarely get time to just sit down and say, hey, buddy, you know, how are you actually <laughs> trying to manage this thing yourself at the moment? Yeah, you know, I it's interesting because, you know, this year has been extremely difficult. And for me, it's been a little disappointing because, you know, I tend to make my most amount of money in sort of the bear markets or large down moves. You know, when I think back to 2018, even late 2015, early 2016, um, again in 2020, that's really where I made the bulk of my money. Um, How are you this doing year, that, Mike, just to cut you off? What was your style? Because in those periods, I was managing a long only global equity strategy. So believe me, I was very much with the good times and riding them higher, say for the pandemic. So up to 18, 19, you know, just pray that rates don't go up, which of course has become a very different environment this year. I was a happy-go-lucky guy. W what were you doing in those environments in terms of your style of strategy? Were you trading options, volatility, or what kind of hedging strategies were you using? Yeah, so, you know, I run a discretionary macro approach and really, you know, I don't do a whole lot of hedging. I sort of subscribe to the view that others have that if you feel a need to hedge something, that might be a sign that you shouldn't have a position on at all. You know, I, I'm happy enough to, if I'm unsure or nervous about a position, I'll just get out and reevaluate, re and I can always get back in. So, you know, it, it's useful to frame how I look at it because it's helpful for why this year has been so difficult. And really, it's sort of your traditional macro sort of cross asset intermarket relationships of looking at leading indicators, looking at things like the copper gold ratio for yields um, to form sort of a framework. And in each of those instances, you know, even leading into the pandemic, I was pretty bearishly positioned um, because the data was actually slowing. I think that's what a lot of people miss is in late 2019 a lot of your leading indicators were actually slowing. And it was just sort of as the pandemic hit us, it just acceler accelerated everything. And so, you know, I was lucky enough to be positioned that way already. Um, but in each of those periods, it was basically the same sort of playbook where you're using these leading indicators, looking across markets and, you know, long bonds, um, short different areas of the market, um, adding a little upside convexity in terms of options. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think that's why this year has been so difficult because I know in a lot of the discussions I've had with with guests on, on Real Vision is there's so many mixed signals and the inflationary environment and the Fed's response has sort of thrown a wrench into that traditional playbook. Right, and that's what's been different this year. It's inflation, and that's something which I'm guessing, being around a similar age and stage of our career, neither you nor I have had to really contend with in the past. This is like very new for for us, as it is for basically anybody who wasn't around trading in the '70s, like uh, perhaps Roger was. 
Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, that's a great point because no matter how much we can study history, I'm a big fan of studying market history, finding analogs, even though we know there's always differences between periods, um, just trying to get a sense for a useful playbook. And you can study it all you want, but until you actually live it, it's hard to explain. Totally. And I think this year has been one of those those times because, like I said, you know, you look at something like the copper gold ratio, it tends to provide an excellent lead for 10 year treasury yields. And this year it's just completely broken down, uh, pro probably because of the inflationary and Fed response. Um, you know, but just all sorts of those mixed signals going on between the market, I think, has just made this year very difficult. So, um, yeah, I mean, again, going back to my framework, I like to look at the world in terms of a few weeks to six or so months okay. um, as sort of my time horizon. I'm trying to really catch the swings in the business cycle. Um, I tend to not get too caught up in the structural arguments because, you know, being in various hedge fund seats before or trading trading seats, I've seen a lot of people get run over, um, you know, buying into the structural arguments. These are so the, the secular things when we say structural. So the, the long-term demographics, debt, doom kind of. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. And I mean, it's so easy because the arguments are so strong and they make sense. Yeah. You know, you, you hear them, them, you research them yourselves and you're like, that's a great point. Hi, I'm Raoul Pal, the CEO and co-founder of Real Vision. The financial world is a complicated world right now. It's a really complicated macro picture and there's a lot of risks. Real Vision and our YouTube channel help you navigate those risks. So subscribe now to the channel and never miss an update. There is simply too much going on. So subscribe now. Thank you. But still the business cycle reigns supreme to me. And if you are blindly following those sort of secular themes, if you can stomach a 30, 40% drawdown in one of your ideas, I mean, kudos to you. <laughs> uh, personally, um, I'm, I take the view of, you know, Paul Tudor Jones, where I have long-term views, but I have a very short-term pain, pain tolerance, if you will. So, you know, it's, it, as soon as I start feeling that pain, it's, it's difficult for me. So I tend to operate in that, you know, a few weeks to six months to, to identify my trades. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, I know you operate a little bit differently. Um, when you talk shorter term, it's a very different description of my, I think, beliefs of shorter term. So, um, you know, I think what would be helpful for me to sort of iron out a lot of the discussions you and I have had in sort of our editorial meetings, um, is where are we going? You know, the whole theme of, of this is don't wait till January, right? And so as people are closing in on the end of the year and whether you've had a good year, a great year, or a miserable year, it's a good point to just sort of reflect on what's happened and really prepare yourself for next year. You know, I think waiting until January, you're already behind the eight ball because institutions will start putting capital to work with whatever their views are. Um, so what what are your views? Well, look, we, we had this, uh, we had the idea of having this conversation a couple of weeks ago now. And at the time of recording this, it was, oh, sorry, at the time we had the conversation to set this up, it also coincided with the week that we had the October CPI released, which saw, I think, a 7.8% rally in the NASDAQ on the day. Um, so I, just to uh, take one step back before we, we get here, um, I, in terms of my process and my investment horizon, it's different personally to how I manage money professionally. So my professional money management prior to Real Vision was global, long only, or long only global equity, um, where my mandate ultimately meant that I was to go to cash rather than attempt to hedge, maybe some index hedging occasionally, but cash was the best hedge, although ultimately, you don't get too much patience being in cash. So I think like every other fund manager in town, curiously, you know, I was in a different part of the market at the same time that you were um, rightly positioning for um, a decline, say, through 2018 and 19. Um, deterioration in economic conditions, perhaps some tightening as well, that was coming from the Fed, although they ultimately pivoted, and then we had COVID just after. But, but I was running a, a quality-focused 
mandate or process. So um, I was actually the beneficiary in a more passive buy and hold long only yeah type approach. I was a beneficiary in a number of those tech names. So when I said it was kind of happy go lucky for me, it was, you know, I was aware of the business cycle and everything else going on in macro. And one of the frustrations that I felt was that I ultimately wasn't able to express that. And instead I was kind of having to sit there and, you know, operate a strategy, which was, you know, it didn't really involve too much of that. Um, so that's just one thing to, to sort of um, set the scene here. Now, moving forward in terms of my personal investing, which is all that I do now, um, as well as representing Real Vision, I, I can do whatever I like, as we all can, um, compared to having that, that mandate of an institution and clients, right? So I, as, as many people probably do who are watching this, have both my pension, so within a tax wrapper, which we can't touch or crystallize until in the case of the UK 57 at the earliest, but probably later by the time we get there, and my personal account as well. So in recent years, I haven't tended to do much so discretionary personal account trading, not a great deal. I tend to focus more on the style I was employing. And of course, I was immersed in the research, looking at single names, quality focus for the fund. So that, given the long term horizon of the pension account, is probably the most suitable strategy. But coming into the reason I'm sort of laying this out for people to understand it, it should hopefully uh, make sense in a few minutes. I came into um, the year, it got to February time and having raised cash in terms of some other assets that I was holding, um, you know, I had cars, but I had a watch collection and other things like that without getting into too many specifics and um, things that had benefited ultimately from the everything bubble where money had found its way into these speculative assets into every corner. Um, it was a hobby of mine to begin with, but then, you know, I could see what was going on and I kept piling up on these things. I understood from the macro that things were deteriorating and that this wasn't going to last forever. So in terms of my personal life, again, without getting too deep into that, um, I began to raise cash where possible, certainly taking profits in bubbly stuff, in frothy stuff. But then it got to the point in February time um, where looking at my pension and long-term accounts, I wanted to go to cash. So I hadn't been doing too much discretionary trading, so that was basically cash position. I took profits in other general assets in my life and then uh, with this view and then uh, as I say from sort of February onwards I've been in cash in my long-term account. Now the reason for all of that preamble is that after the CPI report just as we we're about to talk in I, I said the other day I have a confession to make and I felt so filthy to say this but in my long-term account I've ended up investing it so I've ended up actually going back into the market and investing in a couple of quality names. Now, I understand that things can probably still go against me for quite some time in terms of earnings, potentially quite some time in terms of earnings uh, based on macro conditions. But there were a bunch of reasons, which maybe we'll get into later, as to why I felt that was the time. But what I wanted to do now, and the reason I was going into this, was make that distinction between operating on two very different time horizons, even myself personally, having two very different pots, just as we may have different time horizons between you and I or the next person, right? So everybody's right. going to be different in terms of what we call short term and what we call long term. So taking it back to what you said about your definition of, um, I suppose, your investment horizon being from maybe a, a couple of weeks to maybe about six months, six months is probably at the longer or longest end. For <laughs> yeah. me, in terms of my discretionary trading and how I'm still waiting for otherwise and looking to play the pivot. So the big macro story, which I still expect is going to be some time off or some months off next year. Um, I'm very conscious of what's happening right now. And clearly the, the um, CPI print changed things. So it wasn't a case of waiting until January and going into next year for a certain pot. Again, we can get into the reasoning of that a little bit later, but I felt that had to be done so that if this does prove to be the bottom, which I highly doubt, I hope I'm wrong. So it'll mean that I have a huge buying opportunity in the near term, which is what I've been hoping for all year, right? But hasn't yet transpired, we don't think. Um, I'll have that opportunity to buy everything much lower. And that's why I've been raising cash to do so. So my definition of short term 
or medium term. My horizon is probably six months plus. It's probably six to 12 months. So when, if and when we get that tradable pivot, which we'll maybe get into the macro in a moment to, to sort of explain the sequencing of that, whether it's near, um, I'm looking to have a play for minimum of six months, but probably 12 to 24 months or 12 to 18 months from there. So biz, absolutely business cycle focused. I've done tons of research, but again, we all look at the same thing, but we may actually have drawn different conclusions or have different insights. And that's what we ultimately want to share on Real Vision in general in, in this conversation, hopefully right. together. Um, but look, looking at things, looking at the business cycle, when the ISM bottoms historically, things like, I'm, I, I'm sure we'll get into the NAHB, the housing market index that you, know, you and I, I think, look at quite often and, and we had out uh, earlier this week. Um, when you look at these things, I see particular sectors and stocks, like the materials, and you can take Freeport McMorrin, for example, as basically being the ISM. So when the ISM has bottomed historically, the market or the ISM itself in terms of momentum has tended to recover over 12 to 24 months, where then it's found the peak momentum in terms of the recovery or the reflation of the, of the business cycle of the economy following a trough and obviously the policy response, which, which sort of um, induces that. So that's the reason why I'm talking about 12 to 24 months now, six at a minimum. The reason I mentioned six at a minimum um, as, as a bit of caveat is as again, we should probably get into, so um, we'll get into it in a moment, is that my concern is that this particular recovery cycle or expansion phase will probably be different or may, may be different to previous cycles, given the inflation component or the inflation element, which we have this time around. And it's quite possible from the people I've been speaking with, I was having a chat, for example, with uh, Koku, the, the global head of uh, economics at SOCGEN, has some really smart things to say. And I think it touched on some of the themes of, of uh, Juliet Declare and some of the other guests that we've had on the platform as well recently, who were making this case for perhaps the middle ground or a plateau in rates and in inflation, and potentially extending into that decade of recurrent inflation that we had in the 70s, if indeed, and um, I know Roger talks about and many other people I, I have talked about quite often, um, that would mean equity market volatility is, is likely to be prolonged. We've obviously seen it this year, although we probably haven't seen as much as we should. And I, I think you've got some insights there. Um, but my, the, the fear this time is that we don't get the nice 12 to 24 month initial trend in like the dirty cyclicals and then it extends into everything else. We could just go sideways for a number of years, potentially, if we have these, uh, the, these coincident surges and, and, and drops in inflation each time. So that's why I'm not as confident about the whole 12 to 24 months. It's typically how it's worked in, in, in the past with the recovery, right. the reflation phase, which is why I want the beta, I want the dirtiest stuff and, and, and to get a really sharp appreciation. Um, but this, which is speculative and hence why I'm not doing it necessarily in my, my longer term account. Um, but yeah, that, that's kind of where I'm at. So I'm sorry if that was a bit of a waffle, Mike. I guess there's like a few points that I've touched on there that no, no, exactly. that's that's great background because, you know, I think you hit on a really good point there in terms of where we could likely be headed. And so what what's your view on inflation? I mean, are we going to be stuck in this structurally higher inflation regime? And again, it doesn't have to be 7, 8 percent, 10, 12, whatever percent. It could be three to five percent. Right. Um, what is your view? Are, I mean, are we going to head right back? to the Fed's 2% goal, or is this an ongoing battle for years okay. to come? So first things first, I have no prior experience of an inflationary regime, as many people don't, or many others don't. So I can't speak from first-hand experience, and as we're learning in real time through various chapters and crises, it's very different in reality than it is to when you're looking at historical charts, a program, your macro models, business cycle models, when you're actually going through it. So I can't speak from experience, and I'm not alone in that, okay? At 34 going 35, there's still plenty of people younger who are managing money who definitely haven't uh, went around the 70s. But what I can speak towards is an anecdote, which I think, or, or a saying which serves me pretty well in life in general, is that things are rarely as bad as you think, and they're rarely as good as you hope. So you often, you more likely end up somewhere in the middle, or in the middle ground. And 
this does chime with the conversation which I had with Koku uh, last week, who, again, was making the case for this plateau, this middle ground. And everybody is so, um, just so focused on this binary peak inflation, back to target, that means peak rates and it means rates are going to be cut and it's going back to there and it's the pivot and you've got to buy everything all of a sudden. I just get the feeling that because everybody's focused on that, it's human nature, it's partly greed as well, but it's just human nature to, to want that, like a binary outcome. The, yep. the grey man or the, you saw the, 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 the muddy water in between the two is kind of um, what trading and investing in, in real time is kind of inevitably about. It's rarely that clean cut. I'm probably somewhere in the middle, not to sit on the fence, but somewhere in the middle in terms of the level that inflation ends up at, where it's likely, I think, to remain at a higher plateau now than, than historically. But we've been in a, you know, obviously a very distorted environment for a prolonged period where we've had disinflation and deflation at, at times for a long time now. Um, so I think that regime is over, and that isn't a particularly novel insight. I think I've shared with many people now. Um, but therefore, I don't expect that inflation, as much as anything else, will necessarily look the same as it has done for the last 10, 15, 20 years. Um, right. So mo modestly higher yields in inflation compared to the, the average levels or the target levels, which we've been at over the past sort of 15 or 20 years. What What do you think, I guess, is the uh, the question there? Yeah, I mean, I, I struggle to come to a firm conclusion here yeah. because... You know, I, I hear the arguments, and again, I don't do a lot of secular work. I read a lot of people who do that sort of secular work, and, you know, it's part of that news or research and filtering that every investor has to do. Um, so there's there's theories that I buy into. There's, you know, and of course, you do your own work to sort of corroborate it or, you know, nullify it. Um, and so for me, I'm back and forth because on the one hand – there's a lot of, I think, truth to the undersupply in commodity markets. And it's not just the energy patch, it's metals. And, you know, it's both the supply story and also the demand story. If you look at demand for copper and nickel and other things for electric vehicles and all these sort of longer term, broader goals that not just we here in the United States have, but globally in terms of ESG or whatever you want to call it. So I do see sort of that aspect where we could be headed for this secular bull market for commodities. And that would obviously keep upward pressure on inflation. There's also something that I recently heard from a discussion with Joseph Wang, Fed guy, as he's known yeah. on, on Twitter. And he made a point that I've never heard before, and it really got the wheel spinning in, inside my head. And what he had to say was that, you know, everyone talks about the demographic picture and why that's deflationary, right? You have the boomers generation that they're exiting the workforce. And so their discretionary spending will decline. And, you know, obviously they were feeling a lot of the persistent inflation back in the late 70s, 80s, 90s, and so forth. Um, but his point was that as the boomer generation retires, they're going to continue to spend. Yes, it'll be at a lower pace because they'll be on fixed incomes, drawing from the retirements, but they'll still have demands. Whereas sort of the millennial and Gen Z generations, they're now entering the prime age working years. And so their consumption is going to tick up. And so the inflationary aspect can actually come from not just the demand side, right? You have the demand from the boomer generation, you have the demand from the millennials, um, but also on the labor supply side in that now you have all the boomers retiring. And so there's a lot of these job openings that need to be filled. And so it's sort of this upward pressure on wages and, you know, I think that has some validity to it. Mm -hmm. It's it's not one that I've heard before. Um, so, you know, th those two factors, I think, are definitely in the structurally higher inflation. Again, not saying it's runaway inflation, but 4 or 5% maybe for several years. Yeah. On the other side of that coin, though, I do also have appreciation for someone like Mike Green, who I listened in at his Simplify Entering the Fall event. And he made the case that if you give the economy enough time to sort of retool itself, then 
things will eventually sort of revert back to normal. And he pointed back to the 40s where he had sort of this one to two year huge spike in inflation coming out of the war. Um, but after that, the economy sort of retooled itself. Plants stopped producing military equipment, went back to producing goods. And as that sort of worked itself out, inflation came back down. And I think there's there's an element to that as well, because some of the inflationary pressure has been supply chains, right? We've heard all about it with COVID, um, port congestion, supply chain issues with, with China and other parts of the, of the, of the world. But as more of the supply chain, say, gets moved back to the U.S., mm. we hear about all these new plants opening up and, you know, for for uh, Micron just announced a new plant in, I think, Syracuse, New York. You think of Taiwan Semiconductor, who's announced a new plant in Arizona. I think Intel also announced a new plant. That's going to go a long way towards, I think, reducing the long term inflationary pressures. So, again, whether that takes, you know these plants are going to take a year, two years, maybe to get up and running. But once that does, I think that, you know, pushes back against some of those other inflationary pressures. So, you know, I think because I'm back and forth between these, these different factors, I do come out somewhere similar to you where I think inflation will be a little bit stickier. I think it'll be very hard to go back to say 2%, which is the Fed's goal more so because I think inflation wage is is a bit stickier. And you know, again, and as Joseph outlined, if you have wages running at four to five percent, you're not going to get inflation at two percent. You know, it's just it's just not going to happen. Um and so I think you could be looking at a scenario where again as the supply chains are are being reworked and if you want to call it deglobalization, so you could be looking at a period of two, three, maybe four years where, uh, yeah, there's this back and forth battle of, of fits and starts with with inflation as the Fed is tightening, pausing, tightening, pausing, cutting, you know, whatever whatever they do. Um, I, I could see sort of this volatile back and forth um, in sort of this tug of war and in inflation. But I definitely am not in sort of, like you said, the binary 2% or 10%. Yeah. I, I think um, that's what obviously surprised about the uh, the reaction that we saw in following the the October CPI, although a lot of that, of course, is driven by positioning, seasonality, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, when it's year end, we'll we'll just park that for a minute. Sticking with the the macro narrative here, um, you've probably seen it as well. The the research I forget who did it that um, suggests that whenever inflation has been above, I think five percent, it's taken at least two years to uh, to get back down to target. So. And yep. we're obviously well in excess of, of those levels, and it would take at least two years, and it has taken up to 10 years before. Um, so I think it's it's likely to be with us for some time as it subsides. It's not going to be resolved, I don't think, uh, you know, immediately, so in the next sort of 6 to 12 months necessarily, but it quite possibly is going to begin coming down. And that is, I think, why we saw the reaction as strong as we did, because so much money now has been focused on the change at the margin, so the rate of change, whether or not this is the peak. And in my case, thinking that, well, looking at valuations long term, if we are within, say, 1% even on the 10 year, you know, so we're like at four, four and a bit, even if it had another 100 basis points to run up potentially, which it may not do in this cycle, then, you know, I'm comfortable with like a 5% earnings yield. In quality names, which yeah, I know the earnings can be compressed and all the rest. But let, let's just not go down that rabbit hole for now. Um, sticking with something you said there, something else you said was around housing, millennials, Gen Z, around household formation, um, which has been a, a theme which I know long manager, long on the managers, uh, such as myself, have um, been focused on for a few years now. Um, thinking of the home builders, we've just seen another horrendous NAHB report i think was it down at about 38 or something like that it was in the 30s wasn't it or was 38 i think um yeah i think so yeah i mean if you, you look at the wells fargo traffic home buyer traffic i think is just off the 2008 lows so yeah i mean it doesn't matter which index you look yeah. at it's it's pretty bad now, now there's a business cycle element which is probably where we'll take the conversation in a second you know so we love our, uh, our leading indicators but the the reason that just came to mind as you were talking was that 
if we are in a in a, a period now as a demographic where people will be forming households, forming families, and there's a secular demand for housing. You only have to talk about housing shortage here in the UK. It's chronic, has been for decades, and it probably won't be resolved you know, this year. Um, with rates shooting up as they have, particularly mortgage rates, um, hitting nearly 7% is it in, in uh, North America, I think. Um, it's clearly had an effect on sentiment in the sector. It's obvious to say. It's why it tends to be the first area of the market to roll over. So with that said, in terms of how we might play a recovery, presumably, I've mentioned dirty cyclicals, you know, some of the materials known as perhaps because they're exposed to copper and so on. And actually, in a scenario where we might well be, if the Fed's pivoted too early, for example, um, we do see recurrent inflation actually playing the cycle through the likes of Freeport or somebody like that, right, actually covers covers both bases. So if you're wrong and, you know, in terms of thinking this is, well, this is the pivot or this is the low in the cycle. We get the reflation chapter, which hopefully is going to extend us now for a rally for a few years. But actually, we don't get it for a few years. It's much shorter because it's just caused a reflationary shock where it's going to be back and mm -hmm. forth and hiking and, and easing again, hiking and easing for like years on end. You're actually positioned in, in, in uh, beneficiaries of commodity prices anyway. That kind of covers both bases as opposed to maybe playing the home builders. But as a longer term theme, presumably the home builders would make sense. Yeah, I like, I always believe in the simplest expression of a trade. You know, there's always the second, third, fourth derivatives. And sometimes, yeah, you can really get those convex moves because, you know, the first derivative, the obvious move happens in an asset class and the second or third derivative just kind of languishes behind and it gives you an opportunity to really load up there. On the home builders, that's a perfect example, I think, of this cycle in terms of how people can get caught up in the secular mm -hmm. and get run over by the cyclical. Uh, because home builders have, you know, at, at one point, I think at their lows, they were down 30, 35% a lot of the major names like DR Horton, Toll Brothers, um, Pult Pulte Group, Lennar. And that's strictly been a factor of the rates. Uh, you know, home prices are relatively sticky, and there's arguments around that in terms of people just aren't selling. And so even though buying has stalled out, that's what we're seeing here in the UK, by the way, anecdotally. Yeah, so prices that's... are sticky because transactions just aren't happening. Exactly. Yeah. So I think the home builders is a great example because... Yes, I, the home builders could be a way to play a secular theme, especially if you think rates are topping out. And you know, you could throw up a, a chart of home builders versus a thirty-year treasury yield, um, both absolute and relative performance against the broader market, and it absolutely follows right along with the thirty-year. Um, so, if you are of the view that rates are topping out, um, you know, maybe it's a good tactical opportunity to get long home builders. Um, and, and in that same thought, you know, I, going back to our discussion and sort of this volatility back and forth, I'm very excited about my particular strategy over the next, say, five or 10 years, um, given my time horizon, because I think there will be lots of back and forth volatility to be able to play these sorts of things. Um, and so, you know, we'll we'll get into some yeah. specific expressions uh, for January, I think. But you know, on the home builder front, you know, I kind of look at it again as I come back to the materials, um, as you said, because if inflation is a bit stickier and rates do stay, you know, higher than going right back the ten say the ten year going right back to 0.5%, percent, um, there is an added element to home builder sensitivity in terms of rates, um, but then also margin compression if commodity prices sort of rear their head again and they can't pass those costs on to consumers. So um, that one, I think, is a little bit more difficult of a call than just say, hey, there's this sort of structural deficit in home home supply and you have these demographic shifts. Um, so, yeah, I think I think materials would probably be the better way to play that. Now, I will say the risk with that view is one, I'm particularly bearish on cyclical er areas of the market right now. There's several things that I'm looking at in terms of sort of my business cycle outlook. And 
I think Michael Kantrowitz, um, who again, I, I heard him speak at the Simplify event. Um, he gave a great example of sort of what you were just talking about. He uses what he calls a hope framework. And you follow the business cycle by following these certain areas um, in order. And it's housing, orders, profits, and employment. And as you mentioned, you read some of my my morning notes that I send out. And I wrote just yesterday um, that, you know, if you follow sort of this this framework, you look at housing. Yes, we've seen severe housing demand. We've seen home buyer traffic tumble. We've seen mortgage applications crash. We've seen, um, you know, sales tumble through through the floor. Permits continuing lower, not surprisingly, because the home builders are like, well, costs are high, demand's low, because of rates, so I'm not going to apply for right. permits in the same size. But that's what actually has me especially nervous about the cyclical areas of the market, because I feel like with the big tech unwind, a lot of people are hiding out in sort of the value cyclical areas of the market. Yeah. And, you know, one chart I look at is if you look at sales versus units under construction. And I mean, for those of you who are aware with the gator mouth analogy, macro traders love it because it's a large and growing divergence. And the belief is at some point it'll revert and it's a, it's a great trading opportunity. Um, I mean, it, the sales picture, the mortgage applications, the permits, the sentiment points to a severe contraction in units under construction. And so that's why like when people get arguing about these secular themes, specifically in, in the housing market of, of the shortage, I always point to the units under construction and just say, once these are finished, I mean, can you really, I mean, at least in this in the cyclical again, uh, we could see a huge wave of supply in terms of new homes for sale. Um, and I, I mean, I don't know if that sends actual home prices crashing to the floor. I look at more as a read on activity and what it could mean for, again, orders um and ultimately empl uh, employment yes. you know so if if construction slows down that's i think if i Sets remember correctly housing was something in the low teens in terms of contribution to gdp overall yeah i think um, it's, it's a significant it's really yeah it's significant. significant component uh for growth so you know i look at that and think about how, how people have been sort of hiding out in the value cyclicals, people think of the 2000 playbook, right? Mm. Growth sort of crashed, dot com bubble imploded, and then value outperformed growth. And everyone talks about value outperforming growth. But personally, I think, again, this is sort of my cyclical view is heading into January and, and all of 2023 is the cyclical areas of the market could be as especially vulnerable to, to downside. Um, because if the, the, one thing I think to my ears, having bought uh, having bought quality <laughs> growth, so yeah, please keep going. <laughs> well, I so I think what a lot of people miss when looking at relative performance is that you also have to look at the absolute price charts, right? So, you know, an absolute price or a relative price chart can be up into the right, like values outperforming growth, but that could be a function of growth just falling faster than value. Doesn't mean value is going up. And in the case of 2000, 2001, so the, the dot-com bust. Was value outperforming growth? Yes, it was, according to the category. Or was yep. it the case that tech growth was simply underperforming everything else given its weighting? Well, I'm glad you mentioned the 2000 because, again, I like to use that analogy given everything that's going on. And, you know, there was, there was a component to that cycle, right? Especially... 2000, where growth was falling and value was holding up, even rising. You know, you look at some of the oil names, I know like ExxonMobil. Yes, they were going up while tech was, was collapsing. There was, you know, in terms of that relative performance, it was both uh, of those aspects. But then as we actually eventually hit the recession, right, in 2001, you look at some of those cyclical names and they got hit 30 to 40% um like some serious drawdowns and so i think again for me there's a lot of these types of names whether it's exxon or some material names that are still flirting with all-time highs 
I think that's a major risk because if all of this sort of tech carnage eventually translates, and again, you can also, it's both the tech tech layoffs. You, you hear every day more meta just laid off, I think 11,000 Amazon's laying off 10,000 Twitter just did its own employee purge. So these, the layoffs are coming um, from this sort of tech bubble, if you will, a growth bubble. Um, and similar to that 2001 period, eventually it, it's probably going to translate into a recession. That's certainly my view. You also look at the housing sector that is, you know, you, you listen to some of the comments like DR Horton, CEO on, on their earnings call, Shocking expects there. further contraction in 23, um, expect uh, sales, I think, to be down 25 to 30% in Q1. If all of this is happening, Again, you think of that hope framework and, that. And, and by the way, you, sorry, Mike, you mentioned Micron as well in terms of planning its facilities, but Micron's announcements as well were like, oh my God, the semi sector is also now up the wild. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so if you if you go down that checklist, again, you've had housing collapse. Again, not saying it's a 2008 collapse, but you've had housing, a, a market slowdown. You've had orders slow down you look at the ism new orders index right that has been in contraction for three out of the last four months yeah even um, though the headline is still just holding it feels as though in terms of projections from various things new orders and many other things it seems only a matter of time before that gets lower surely it yep. to. and then you look at profits you know you've heard target walmart various retailers you've heard the likes of Google or Al Alphabet, um, they're talking about compressed uh, uh, profit margins. So now it's starting to hit profits. That hasn't been really reflected in earnings estimates, but it's starting to. Um, so the next leg in that framework is employment. And again, I go back to those sort of announcements and a lot of people say, yeah, but the, the employment market is so strong. Well, my counter to that is these layoffs tend to take time. I've, mm. I've worked at a large corporation before and these plans don't happen to me. Twitter, yes, Elon Musk came in and fired however many people right off the bat. They were gone that day. That can happen. But a lot of times in these sort of restructurings, they'll do a redu what they call a reduction in force. And that's a whole planning, right? They say, okay, what areas need trimming? What are you know the, the excess fat? The tech layoffs will start to hit, I think, the employment figures. Um, but but and again, then I think today, Mike, we still haven't. We've just had the initial jobless claims out again. The remaining yeah. around, was it 220,000, give or take? They've remained there now yep. for like five weeks, and that's having risen off the lows where it looked as though they were going up, they went back down, sub 200. Yep. And, and despite all of this, even the initial jobless claims have yet to, to to move properly, which is just the thing that I can't fathom. So we've got this, it feels as though there's this crisis coming, waiting to happen on Main Street, but we've perhaps priced in, to a large extent, the now the, the recession of Wall Street or the Wall Street recession as it sees it. I, I think, I don't know if we've priced in the recession on Wall Street, because if you look at earnings estimates, they really haven't, haven't declined too much. Um, and again, there's been a bifurcation in the market where tech and growth has been hammered. Um, and people have been hiding out in those cyclical areas. And I forget who it was I heard speaking the other day, and they said, you notice that in sort of the the relative performance, right? If you look at this year and what's been performing, it's been quality, rising rates. You want, you know, the safer company, strong balance sheets, high cash yeah, flow. Yeah, McDonald's and so on, hasn't it, this year? The yeah, yeah, you look at the quality companies. names. Yeah. That's been doing extremely well. But then on the other hand, you have sort of the cyclical areas, Banks have been holding up incredibly well, materials, things like that. And so it, the thing that I think people need to differentiate is, is have the rise in rates been growth driven or have they been inflation driven? Oh, surely because inflation if, driven, right? Surely. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, growth obviously has been slowing. So it's largely been, been inflation. And so I think what we saw, as you mentioned in the October print there, was, yeah, inflation prints are going to continue softening. It's it's the nature of base effects. You look at commodities, they've softened off their highs. Um, there's different components from wages and rent and, and home prices and health care. The reality is base effects, you're going to see a softening in prints. Not whether that comes down to 6%, 5%, whatever it is, yeah. I don't know. Uh, I, I'm not in the business of economic forecasting. Um, but... 
you know, I, I do think that as you start to see that rollover or softening inflation prints, the bond market will get, get a little bit excited because the bond market's been hammered this year. And as I said, a lot of those indicators I use have been dead wrong. And even though my view has been wrong on bonds this year, I've luckily stayed out of trouble because of my more technical trading models for my timing. Um, but if that's starting to turn, then you know you could get a a big bounce um, in bonds or a retreat in yields here. So, um, and I think if that happens, again, it's sort of that wrote flow chart of capital, if you will, where then the cyclicals could actually get hit, right? Because that the might yield, be the yield real fall, presumably the right. The realization the value of cyclicals also brings some right yeah the sort of realization that this hasn't been growth this has been inflation and if that's starting to turn and yields are coming down then do you want cyclicals especially like the banks i mean particularly i'm so bearish on the banks and it's been one of my most frustrating trades this year um so yeah i mean i i think that's for me that's the framework i go into 2023 is employment has been firm but I think that's the next shoe to drop. And, you know, as you mentioned, if you look at payrolls or you look at unemployment rate, if you keep an eye on the ISM new orders index, which again, I think the latest print was like 49.5, but the last three out of four months have been negative or in contraction below 50. It's when you see a, like a real plunge in new orders, which again, if the housing market has screeched to a halt, like people think, um, or the data shows that if you see that plunge in new orders, that tends to really be sort of that kick, kicking off point of when unemployment just skyrockets. And in terms of playing it, Mike, would that be the point at which you would then be looking at bonds? And in, if you are, then are you looking at, I suppose it depends on the, the inflation scenario, of course. So if inflation appears to have peaked, so there appears to be negative momentum in inflation. We don't know where it's going to settle, but it could be no time. And it might not be. There's plenty of people who suggest it's <laughs> it's foolish, completely foolish to think it's anywhere near peaking. But if if that's the case and it's more of a disinflationary move that we have, um, so inflation down, growth obviously down, um, uh, but the, the Fed hasn't pivoted, as we see employment or initial jobless claims shooting up, presumably at some point. Is that the point that we should focus on the long end? Because there isn't that inflation risk. It's, it's working in the favor of uh, long bonds. Whereas if or when the Fed pivoted around that point and it came too soon, then it'd probably be the short end given the inflation risk of the Fed pivoting prematurely before we've seen a real... So, so to, to, is that how you see it? In my mind, it's okay, bonds are just a no-go, it feels like. There are no-go as they haven't have been all year. There are no go until, at least, until you see the initial jobless claims beginning to really shoot up. And that could be the point they begin looking at 30s. Yeah, so I, I think right now, you're better off serve playing the long end. And that, again, comes from my view that even if we have this sort of elevated inflation point, um, for the next two to three years, that shouldn't have a long lasting impact on say the 30 year treasury or even the 10 year. Um, you know, if in say 10 years, inflation is back to 2% or 1%, whatever it is after the economy retools itself, then, you know, I know yields have declined in the last few days, but 4% on the 10 year isn't all that terrible. Uh, so, so I think you're better off with the long end right now and eventually looking to migrate again, the short-term yields are so attractive. The issue with short with playing, say in the two year is you have that reinvestment risk, right? So if you hold those to maturity, um, both capital gains and the yield, and you have to roll those in two years, and if the Fed is cutting and say the two years back down at one percent, then yeah, four and a half on the two year, you know, looked great, but now you have to reinvest at one percent. It may not be all that great. So for me, I there, like there are a few things that I look at to sort of help me time the short ends, and 
you know, one is the Fed spread. You look at sort of the two year versus whether it's the four week or even 90 day T bills. And when, whenever that's become deeply inverted, right, like the, the ultra short, short end being so closely tied with the Fed funds versus the two year, that's sort of the market telling the Fed that they're making a mistake. Um, so that could be what we're starting to see right now is that the softening inflation is actually a result of an oncoming recession so in 2023. Et cetera. Yeah, yeah. And so if they still plan on, you know, getting to 5%, 5 percent, five point eight, I think Bullard, you know, at the time of this recording this morning, he said he, he thinks that they could be between five and seven percent. I mean, I'll take yeah. the under on that. Yeah. yeah um yeah. so so yeah, I you know, look, I, I think you're getting to that point where you can play the short end, especially because of the the attractive carry that you get. Um, and, you know, I, yeah, I mean, for me, I, I think from an asset allocation standpoint, I like to look at what's, what's more attractive on a relative basis. Again, I don't operate really long term, um, but that long term helps inform my short term. And I look at something like the S&P 500 dividend yield versus the two-year treasury yield. Yeah. And that's the most, that spread is the most negative since I think just before 2008. Um, I mean, it is incredibly negative over two and a half percent. So you're getting paid, you know, assuming equities stay flat, you hold the S&P 500, you get its dividend yield um, versus holding the two-year yield. You're getting, I think, 2.6% excess return by holding the two year. So with all that elevated uncertainty that we could be looking at, I just struggle to see a ton of upside in equities right now, given that incentive for people to say, you know what, I'm just going to park it over here and get the yields. If you have this continued softening in, in inflation, you have yields starting to roll over, you have this sort of year end, you know, January effect where you get a big mean reversion in performance. And that works again, also, my bearish outlook for things like energy and cyclicals, now people can sell those at long-term capital gain rates. And so January, they're buying you know, the ones that they sold for the tax losses, and they're selling the ones that they were winners on. Um, so you could see a really big factor rotation, I think, in January, mm. early next year. Um, I'm particularly bearish on oil, and I know there's a lot of guests that come on here that are very vocal about bullish oil. Uh, for a ver for various reasons, and there's a lot of great cyclical or secular arguments. I again, I just I have to follow the business cycle, and I can't imagine a world where oil is completely unaffected by that. Um, and oil does tend to be the last to fall, and the reason for that is simple. Um, it's essentially, you know, it's at a certain level, it's discretionary spending, right? Taking trips, flying on an airplane, going for a drive with the family. But at a basic level, it's also a necessity. You have to keep your house warm. You have to get back and forth to work. It goes into everyday goods, your toothbrush. So there's an underlying demand to it. Um, so it does tend to be the last to sort of fall. You know, the copper does tend to lead oil. And so I, you know, look, I'm looking to play oil, oil on the short on the short side here in sort of the shorter term. Um, says nothing about my long term structural view, but um, I think if you could target sort of again a pullback in yields, you could target sh you know shorting some of the cyclical areas. Um, if you want to play on the long side in growth, you can. I I personally I. Uh, I struggle. I think tech is, is dead money for for the next several years. So there's could there could be a short term bounce. But again, I just I think that it's been difficult this year to play that sort of cyclical slowdown because employment has been stickier, inflation has wreaked havoc on that playbook. But I think 2023 could be a really big year for that. Again, shorting cyclicals, particularly banks. You have a if yields are pulling back, the curve is deeply inverted. That's terrible for bank health. Um, so I'm looking at things like that, oil on the short side, banks on the short side, um, and then and then bonds. You know, I, you look at it, I think it's a record short position in the two-year treasury um, futures. We, we should also chime with presumably near records, certainly recent record longs in the dollar. But yeah, it's just pulled back. People are now like, oh, God, is this start liquidation? So therefore, you don't want to step in front of that. Yep.
it's all seemingly the same trade. Yeah. So, you know, I think there's a lot of value in fixed income as we look into next year. So, again, it, the carry aspect is very attractive. Um, and then for the people that want to get a little bit more nuanced, you know, I do like the idea of a curve steepener. Um, so just explain and, what that is for, for people. Who yeah. So basically a curve steepener, you're betting on either a, you're, you're betting on the spread between the 10 year yield and the two year yield yes. to widen out. And, and Roger just did a great piece on this. Um, he did a great, we got the message to explain the different versions of, of bear steepener, bear flattener, bull steepener, bull flattener. And if you're going to take a view on overall interest rates, then that's where the bull and bear are versions of these come into play because you can adjust your duration exposure. I personally think a duration neutral um, expression of a, of a steeper curve. So basically you're betting that 10 year yields will rise faster than two year yields or two year yields will fall faster than 10 year yields as your, as your steepener situation. So is that a re duration replay, replay? So that's why I like it because it works in really either tell scenario it works in a reflationary situation because if it's growth driven then the, the long end of the curve should stay stickier and higher because um, people are sensitive to inflation expectations which obviously right. are about to stimulate a load of growth inflation expectations are commensurate with that exactly it works if the fed you know people talk about the fed the fed pivoting well yeah. the curve should steepen significantly if the fed's pivoting because if the fed's pivoting they're going to be cutting rates um where you'd see sort of that short end theoretically fall faster than the long end because again cutting interest rates is stimulative to economic growth expectations so the two year should fall faster than the 10 year um, so it works in sort of either scenario, a crisis, severe slowdown, recession, because the Fed's cutting, um, which should short-term rates fall. Long-term rates will fall too, but probably not as fast. Um, but it also works in a reflationary situation because the back end should rise faster than the short end. Um, and so I really like that. And again, like I said, I like the duration neutral of it. And you know, basically what you're doing is you're, you're matching the duration of the bonds to make sure. So I think it's for every dollar that you're short 10 year treasuries, you have to be long four and a half times two year treasuries to be duration neutral. And what that does is it basically removes your view on interest rates. So you don't care if the whole curve shifts up or down, you're strictly betting on the shape of the curve. Um, we just hit, I think like negative 0.62, which is yeah. more inverted than since pre uh, the basically the 1980s, I think. Mm. And if you look at different versions of the curve, you know, I've noticed that the 30 year, five year yield curve tends to lead the 10 year, two year yield curve. Um, and the 35 year has been steepening quite dramatically lately. It's almost, if not already out of inversion. And so I like that 10 year, two year um, curve steepener um, for sort of that tail play, because when the curve steepens, it doesn't, it's not a slow move. It's, it's a very dramatic move. So, um, you know, that's a, a little bit more nuanced play, but that's another one that I really like, I think for next year. I think that sounds like a great play and probably a, a good way to, uh, to, to sort of conclude, Mike, we've, um, we've run through plenty there. We've touched on the macro. We've certainly touched on expression time horizon in my case is probably the, uh, the biggest takeaway. Um, because I very much share the, I think the the same view as uh, as as you in terms of how this plays out and it taking time and it being complicated in terms of the path of how we get there, but it looks fairly clear what needs to happen. Um, albeit I have made a move in one account, but in the other I'm very very much focused still on that on that game. So um, hopefully people have found that useful, and uh, yeah, good to uh, good to finally have time to catch up and uh, yeah, talk markets with a bit of personal uh, touch in terms of how we're actually playing it individually and what we're looking at. But the the clear message here is don't wait until January. We have this playbook in mind already. And should things change, which as they did, you know, quite significantly, as it appears at this moment in time, it may be insignificant come another bouncing <laughs> CPI probably next month. Um, it's, it's really important that we're, we're on top of things right now because this stuff could move at any time. I'm not expecting that the Fed pivots in, in December. I don't think anybody is really. Um, 
but the data are coming through all of the time and should since you know if we take employment for example um should those layoffs that have been announced begin to show up all of a sudden in the initial jobless claims numbers the bond market could be primed in the way that the equity market was primed for quite a strong move a couple of weeks ago after cpi it could also be primed it obviously moved off to cpi as well bonds but it sort of faded it, it, it could be primed for another uh, big move. So important to uh, be prepared. And uh, yeah, whatever's left of the year now, a few weeks could be uh, could be an eternity in trading if things get uh, if things get a little bit groovy. It might not be the longest uh, festive season that we uh, that we enjoy time off from. But um, yeah, I guess that's a message. Don't wait until January. Yeah, you know, it's it's been great catching up and I love to hear your perspective because we share sort of the same macro views, but different expressions. Um, but yeah, I, I totally agree, James, that do not wait till January to sort of kick into your New Year's resolution. Uh, do the homework now because come January, a lot of these plays are, are going to be unfolding, whether we're right or wrong. Um, so now is the time to be doing your homework when you have some some slow time. It's been a frustrating year, but don't get too down on yourself because there's definitely going to be a lot of opportunities. Um, like I said, not only in 2023, but I think it's a, a very fruitful environment for people that are willing to be active over the next several years. Well, let's jump right into the key takeaways in that conversation, because as you saw, Mike and James both agree that there's no clear playbook to follow right now. And that's because so much of what we've seen in the past few months really doesn't follow clear historical patterns. But Mike really drove home the point why you can't wait until January for your portfolio. And that's because so many institutions will have already started putting money to work. Now, one thing is clear, both of them stress the importance of knowing your time horizon. There's so much said on Real Vision that even if it comes to fruition, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will fit your portfolio because we each have such varying time horizons. Now, as I look over my notes here, both struggle to come to a firm conclusion with inflation, though they agree that it will settle at a higher level in 2023. Now, both agree that the recent layoffs that we've seen in the tech sector, think Amazon, Meta, and Twitter, that that will start hitting employment numbers in the year to come. And, that, and when that happens, you'll have to start looking at the bond market. Now, Mike says that he really struggles to see much upside in equities right now. And he thinks the cyclical areas of the market could be particularly vulnerable in 2023. And neither Mike nor James believe that we'll see an end to the current market volatility in the next three to six months. And they believe a path toward resolution is constantly changing based on global economic conditions, which means you absolutely cannot wait until January to adjust your portfolio. See you in 2023. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.